Yeah, welcome back and um, welcome to everybody. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this uh, very nice meeting of, for inviting me to give a talk about optical absorption spectroscopy. I was already last year um, at this meeting and gave a talk entirely about MCD spectroscopy but the organizers decided that maybe this was a bit too special and maybe it would be better to first focus on optical absorption. So I will mainly deal with optical absorption, but uh, in the last part of my talk, I will speak about MCD. Okay. Um, Uh, an optical spectrum, I want to begin with very basic, consists of uh, bands and uh, these bands have uh, positions and intensities and these bands uh, correspond to electronic transitions and uh, the position of these bands you can infer from an energy level scheme, so it corresponds to an energy level scheme, which you can derive, for example, from MO theory, or ligand field theory, or all these things which you learn here. And the intensity, intensity corresponds uh, to the area of the band, and uh, the area is uh, half width times maximum absorption, and the absorption is given in terms of the uh, molar decadic absorption coefficient, which appears in uh, the lambert beer law, which is given here. So the log i over i naught, and i is the intensity, uh, i and i naught correspond to the intensities of the radiation field before and after passing the sample equals minus epsilon, so this epsilon is the molar decadic absorption coefficients times the concentration, and I've put the concentration as C prime in order to distinguish it from C, the velocity of light, times the path length. And uh, so this optical absorption uh, is an interaction between a, a property of the radiation field, the intensity, and uh, the epsilon value, which is a property of the molecule. And the concentration and the path length are, of course, the experimental parameters which you just uh, set. Okay, so um, we have the interaction between the molecule and the electromagnetic uh, field. And uh, light is an electromagnetic wave which travels, for example, in, in Z direction here. And I have put here a, a polarized light. And um, it consists of an electric field, for example, along the X direction, and a magnetic field, H, um, for example, along the Y direction, which um, are perpendicular to each other and oscillate in phase. And uh, EX and HY are described by uh, these equations, the wave equations. So, for example, the electric field is 2 times EX uh, naught uh, times cosinus omega t minus z over c. So, omega is the uh, angular frequency, p is prime, z is the z coordinate, and um, c is the velocity of light. And uh, you can also write this as a sum over um, exponential functions with um, very complex arguments. The i omega t minus z over c plus uh, e uh, exponent, exponential of minus i omega times t minus z over c. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the same for h y. And as I said, electric, E is electric field and uh, H is a magnetic field vector. <coughs> okay, some important physical quantities here, which you may know. Um, omega times two, 2 pi nu is the angular frequency and often in 
optical spectroscopy, you give your frequencies not in, in hertz, but in wave numbers, which is new uh, tilde. And this is times, uh, this is two, uh, two pi times uh, c over lambda, and lambda is uh, the wavelength, and um, the frequency and uh, the uh, wavelengths uh, are connected by uh, so the product is uh, just the velocity of light. Uh, three times 10 to the <coughs> eighth uh, meter per second. So these wave equations EX um, and HY are functions of Z and T and describe the um, three properties of electromagnetic radiation. <coughs> for a snapshot in time, for example, at uh, t equals zero, the electromagnetic wave is a periodic vibration in space. And uh, second, on a fixed point in space, for example, at the origin, uh, the electromagnetic wave is periodic vibration in time, and the wave front propagates with the uh, velocity of light. And um, so this is light, and what is intensity? Intensity is what appears in the number of data law, as you may remember. The intensity of radiation is the amount of radiation energy which passes through an area A perpendicular to the direction of propagation of the light per time. And you can write the intensity as energy density, the energy density of the radiation field times the velocity of propagation, the velocity of propagation is, of course, uh, the velocity of light. And uh, the energy um, is given in terms of uh, what times second over a cubic meter <coughs> times a meter per second is uh, watts per uh, square meter. So this is the intensity by which you hit your sample. And this uh, total energy density is composed of electric energy density and a magnetic en energy density, and the electric energy energy density is um, one half epsilon zero times the x square, and the epsilon zero is, is given here. So this is in the SI system. The magnetic energy density for magnetic is one half times mu naught times hy square, and mu naught is given here again in terms of the SI system, you need these uh, constants. And uh, the electric energy density equals the magnetic energy density, so the total energy density of the radiation field is uh, the sum of the electric energy density and the magnetic energy density is, for example, two times the electric energy density is two times is epsilon null, epsilon zero, ex square. So the EX square is now time dependent, as we have seen. So one has to average over time. What we needed here was the average energy density. So we have to average over the cosine square, omega t, which gives you a factor of one half. One half times four gives, gives two uh, epsilon x zero square. So this is the total energy density of the radiation field. <clears throat> and of course, normally you don't have just a polarized radiation along the x direction, but you're, you have an isotropic radiation field, so you have to sum up the, the contributions from x, y, and zero. So your total energy density is uh, two times epsilon null, epsilon naught, um, the um, uh, epsilon uh, zero as a, as a vector square, so the um, modulus of epsilon zero square. And this we just call u. So normally it's called u in the, in the textbooks. So this is uh, the part of, or this is uh, what, what the radiation field does. Now we consider the interaction of our molecule, of a molecule with, with a radiation field, and the molecule is supposed to have two states, L and M, and L is the ground state, and M is an excited state. Uh, we have 
uh, an energy EL in the, in the epsilon L in the, in the ground state and uh, epsilon M in the excited state. We have a transition energy epsilon M minus epsilon L equal H mu ML or H bar omega ML. And uh, the in molecule is unperturbed in the ground state, CL. And now the radiation field introduce, induces a transition to psi M, the excited state. And the reason is a periodic perturbation of the molecule by the incoming radiation. So what we have to do is um, time-dependent perturbation theory. And I will not go through this in, in detail. I'll give you only a very uh, brief account of that. So we have a perturbation operator, H bar, or H prime. Uh, as a function of time, is H prime not um, time? Uh, here you see the time dependence. Uh, it's uh, again a, a, a cosine omega t. And you have uh, an interaction. So the, the, um, the Hamiltonian is an interaction between the electric dipole moment, and now comes a molecule into play. Electric dipole moment uh, times um, the electric field vector um, as a um, scalar product. And the electric dipole moment is um, minus E, so charge times uh, summation uh, over all the um, um, coordinates of, of the electrons. So this is your perturbation operator. And um, uh, for if you have a, a time dependent perturbation, there's a very nice formula that you can just apply without doing time dependent perturbation theory, which is the golden rule. And it might, might have appeared in this lecture series already. And uh, if, if you have such a, a time dependent perturbation, you can say the probability for the transition from the ground state to the L, to the excited state M, is given by this expression, so 2 pi over h bar times um, the matrix element of the perturbation uh, Hamiltonian h prime Lm squared times Me, and Me is the energy density of the final space. And this refers to the situation that normally you just don't have one final state, but you have a distribution of final states. Either the molecule is a distribution of final states, the transition is not sharp, or you irradiate into a very sharp transition with a broad source. It has these two aspects. Um, okay, so we have our um, uh, perturbation operator here, the H prime LM, which is a matrix element of the perturbing um, Hamiltonian between the um, ground state L and the excited state M. And the um, Hamiltonian is, as I said, a, a scalar product between the electric dipole moment and uh, the electric field vector. Now this is a property of the radiation field, so this is a property of the molecule, and you have to take, if you, if you take this matrix element, you have to take the matrix element over the new operator, and we call this new Lm. And uh, so this uh, interaction here is minus mu Lm times um, scalar product times electric field vector. So we have to square it. And uh, it's the square of this interaction. And it's the square of the dipole, electric dipole matrix element. And the square over the electric field vector times the cosine square of the angle between the electric field vector and the electric dipole moment. And if you take the square of a, of a cosine, cosine square, and square, average it 
overall possible orientations, you get the factor one over, one over three, one third. And uh, so for an isotropic radiation field, this uh, perturbing <coughs> matrix element squared is one third electric dipole matrix element times um, uh, E naught squared. Uh, and this E naught squared we now take from uh, here. U is U over six epsilon. Zero. Okay, so we finally have this expression here, which you can use. It's a uh, golden rule again. It's two pi over h bar times the square of the transition dipole matrix element times the energy density of uh, the excited states times the energy density of the radiation field. So your transition probability is a product of a molecular property the transition dipole moment um, matrix element and uh, the property of, the, of your incoming radiation field, namely its intensity, the intensity just. The higher the intensity, the higher is the transition probability. The higher the dipole matrix element, the higher is the transition probability. And uh, this uh, and E is the number of states per energy and an interval, uh, Vn over Ve, and uh, you can also um, Write this as a number of states per frequency interval. So then it's a mu, or you can write it as a number of states per omega interval when it's a, an omega, or a number of states per wave number of interval. Often you find different expressions for these um, transition probabilities because just these factors are different. So I, I put this here for you to sort this out. Yeah, so far, and Frank really wanted to put me this, put me uh, in that, that remark. So far, we have only considered electric dipole, electric dipole interaction uh, of the molecule with the radi radiation field. So this is our perturbing operator. Uh, it's an interaction between the electric dipole moment and uh, the electric field vector. But uh, there are higher order terms in the interaction of the molecule with the radiation field. And actually, all the people who have had higher, higher level uh, physical chemistry or spectroscopy courses know that. It's, uh, it's a Taylor series of uh, exponents IKR. Um, higher order terms in the interaction of the molecule with the radiation field lead to electric quadrupole, EQ, and magnetic dipoles and the interactions and the corresponding Hamiltonians are, and I have put one possible source here, but there are many others. This is electric quadrupole Hamiltonian, or the Hamiltonian of the electric quadrupole interaction, which uh, is uh, a product of R times the gradient operator times R um, times the um, electric field vector, which you can write as a, as a triple product of the gradient operator and the tensor Q, which is a quadruple tensor, and the electric field, that's understood here that the gradient is taken from the electric field, and the um, gradient of the electric field is EIK times electric field. So you have uh, expression here which contains a k vector of the radiation, which is the direction in which the uh, radiation uh, proceeds, and uh, the q tensor, and the electric field vector. And it's something which looks like, if you, if you write it explicitly, it looks like kx, ky, And this is a this is a Q vector, Q um, particle 
normative tensor and what takes x, 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 y, takes z, y, x, y, 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 z, left x, left z. And for example, if you direct your um, radiation in z direction, and it's polarized along the x. Then it projects out the uh, xz part of the particle tensor. So, which means your, your matrix element of the perturbation is now determined by a product of coordinates, not of x, y, and z, but of a product of coordinates. And this is, these are quadruple selection rules. Serenant has also mentioned that in her talk. <coughs> and uh, a third, a third um, contribution is a uh, contribution between the magnetic dipole moment and uh, the magnetic field. Um, and uh, this uh, you can write as a um, um, three points, uh, angular momentum operator uh, R uh, cross uh, P. Uh, so um, uh, the, the magnetic dipole moment as a sum over um, angular momenta of all electrons R cross P times the B. Yes? Uh, Felix, I want to mention yesterday I was uh, talking about Mosfort because we have yes. also quadrupole. Yes. It's an electric field credit tensor yes. uh, on the screen. This is the, this is the quadrupole moment of the electric charge distribution, not yes. of the nucleus that we had discussed yesterday. Yes. So it's a, a question of the shape of the electric charge distribution. Yes. And in most of our spectroscopy, the quadrupole tensor may have looked a little, little bit different. Instead of just xx, xy, and so on, you have one over three, three xi, xj minus delta ij, and so on. So you subtract the invariant. So it's a little bit different, but in principle, yes. It's a, it's a. No, it's not a nuclear quadrupole. Yeah, that was my remark. It's yeah, the quadrupole yeah. moment of the electric charge distribution. Here we have the electric charge distribution of the molecule. So the quadrupole tensor of the of the molecule, which is uh, determined by the electric by the, the distribution of the electrons. Right. Okay. So um, H E Q and H M D lead to electric quadrupole and uh, magnetic dipole transitions. Uh, as I said. Uh, HEQ is the interaction between the electric particle moment and the gradient of the electric field. Um, and these EQ transitions involve uh, matrix elements of products of coordinates. HMD is the direct action between the magnetic vector of the radiation field and the magnetic dipole of the molecules. And MD transitions involve matrix elements of the angular momentum operators. However, you can do optical spectroscopy with, without knowing about electric quadrupole and magnetic dipole transitions because normally these transitions are orders of magnitude less intense than electric dipole transitions. So we want to focus on electric dipole transitions in, in what follows. Okay, so we have now derived a quantum mechanical expression for a transition probability. If you have an electronic absorption, you have an electric dipole moment, you have incoming radiation, you apply the Fermi Golden Rule, you can here here on, on Orca course, you can calculate all these entities and derive your transition probability. But of course we want to also want to have a correlation to the experiment and this correlation to the experiment is given by the to something which is called integrated absorption. And uh, integrated absorption again um, starts from the from the Lambert-Bear law, I times I naught uh, times 
exponential function over minus 2.303 times epsilon times c prime times d, which refers to this experimental arrangement. You have a sample in a, in a volume b, which is uh, a times dx. So this is your path length. Here's your initial intensity. Here's your intensity, which comes out of the solution. So these are intensities. Epsilon is a multiplicating absorption coefficient. This is a concentration of C prime and D equal dx as a path length. And one can establish a relation between um, epsilon and nu Lm, so the transition energy, as well as uh, nu Lm. So these are quantum mechanical uh, entities and um, Epsilon is something that you derive from the experiment, and uh, there's a um, uh, connection between those two. So let's again recall the intensity I was the amount of radiation energy which passes through an area A perpendicular to the direction of propagation per time, and this was a U times Z. So this was the energy density of the radiation field times the velocity of light. And um, I put, I write the golden rule here, and I, um, I uh, replace uh, the, uh, this U um, by the um, intensity over C. So, and now we consider that volume, there are N, N B molecules in it. Uh, so, in the volume B, A, D, X, N, B is the number of, of molecules in the, in the volume. N, B times B is N, B times A, B, X molecules. And uh, that the number of molecules in the volume B, which undergo a transition L to M, is the time interval D, T, D is um, D, N, B, nb times adx times the transition probability times dt. So this transition probability we take from the golden rule. And each transition absorbs the energy h bar omega nl. So per time interval dt, we absorb an energy de, which is given by this expression here. And the energy absorbed per time in area is then de over at. And this is for the definition of di times the number of molecules um, per volume times the x times this transition energy times uh, the energy of, of one transition. And uh, now I put here the expl explicit expression for WLM from the, from the golden rule, which you saw here. And thus we have the i over i is mv dx 2 pi over 6 epsilon 0, epsilon 0 h bar plus matrix element squared times omega ml times the energy, the, the density of states in, in uh, terms of, of the angular frequencies. On the other hand, we have an expression over the i over i from the um, lambert beer law. So we can equate the two right-hand sides of these two equations and um, arrive at an equation which on the left-hand side has the epsilon and the omega ml, and on the right-hand side has the ULM squared times the n omega, the energy density of states in uh, frequency units. The NV over the concentration is just the um, Avogadro number, and okay, this is uh, the constants. And now we know the transition is smeared out over many final states, so we have to integrate over the entire band. So we make an integral epsilon uh, from omega over omega the omega, on integrate here of the energy density of states, which gives one. We just integrate of the whole band. And you can write this integral also in terms of uh, wave numbers and have, in principle, on the right hand side, just uh, the transition dipole matrix element times a constant. And now you have a product here under the integral of an epsilon 
over u times uh, the u, and uh, u makes an approximation does that the u does not change much over the bandwidth. So you just put here a central frequency. So basically, now you have on the right hand side, uh, on the left hand side, the area of the band, and on the right hand side, the frequency times the constant times uh, the transition uh, moment squared. And this is called integrated absorption. It tells you the area of your band just corresponds to the square of the transition moment integral. So the transition moment integral, which you can calculate from quantum mechanics, you can calculate with the area of your absorption band. And uh, if you work, if you express your mu in terms of the charge times distance in terms of angstroms, then you have uh, this uh, constant here between the area of the band and the uh, transition moment squared, 2.5 two times 10 to the third. And uh, okay, epsilon usual units. More often, you will find in the literature that people do not know, do not use uh, the integrated absorption of oscillator strength. So all the quantum chemical programs give you the oscillator strength of, of a band. And uh, the oscillator strength is uh, a constant times the area of the band, or for a Gaussian band shape, you can write this as a product of the maximum absorption times the bandwidth. On the other hand, we have, with this equation here, uh, theoretical expression um, for the oscillator strengths in terms of transition frequency and the square of the dipole matrix element. And um, so there's a, normally a correlation between the epsilon values and um, oscillator strengths for very intense large transitions. You have epsilon values in the order of a couple of 10,000 to 100,000, and F gets close to unity. For principal reasons, F cannot be greater than unity. So parity forbidden transitions, and I come to this point in a minute. Uh, the epsilon values are smaller than 1,000, and uh, oscillator strengths are below um, uh, 10 to the minus 1. And for spin and parity forbidden transitions, uh, you have epsilon values from 10 to uh, 10 to the minus 2, and the oscillator strength are the order of 10 to the minus 5. Okay, let's take a typical example for a band which has quite large oscillator strengths, an LMCT band in the UV. And I took just the example because the numbers are so nice. You have a transition energy of 250 nanometers, so it's in the UV. Uh, you have a large epsilon, 30, 33,000, it's a large epsilon. You have a bandwidth of 3,000 wave numbers, so this is normal for optical transitions. So the epsilon times the uh, bandwidth is 10 to the 8th. And um, from uh, that equation here, we get that the oscillator strength is 0.4. A fairly large number, 0.4. Fairly large oscillator strengths. And then I take the other equation here, this one. 0.4 is about 10 to the minus 5 times a new prime. Uh, uh, so the, the central frequency, which is 40,000 wave numbers for a band at 250 nanometers. And uh, this says this. Uh, transition dipole matrix elements there is just unity. So you are transferring, when you have such an LMCT band and such an oscillator strength, you transfer one elementary charge over one angstrom, and a typical metal bond length is about two angstroms, so you transfer half an electronic charge over a full transition metal root bond lengths. So you transfer less 
You would call this uh, LMCD band in the transition matter complex, but as a matter of fact, you transfer less than one electron, and this is due to the fact that your ground state contains a little bit of the excited state, and your excited state con contains a little bit of your ground state, and you have covalent mixing because between your metal and your ligaton. Okay, let's go, but let's go now to transitions which are much less intense. These are ligand field transitions. And uh, uh, hearing so much from Ed Solomon's work, also from Serena, I start with uh, favorite um, metal from Ed Solomon, which is copper. We uh, do electronic absorption spectroscopy on square, square planar copper complexes. And um, electronic absorption spectroscopy of these ligand field transitions determines, effectively determines the splitting of the orbitals in the ligand field. And the uh, favorite object was for a very long time tetrachlorocuprate, copper 2, with four chloride layers. <coughs> it's an E9 system, it's quadratic planar. So your highest occupied orbital is uh, dx square minus y square, and this is singly occupied, it's a homo or the somo if you want. And all ligand field transitions go into this singly occupied orbital, which all you also can say all ligand field transitions go into the hole in the D10 configuration. You have a hole in the D10 configuration and you're filling this hole by making transitions from uh, lower line orbitals. So the x square minus y square is the highest and then you have uh, orbitals at lower energy which are all doubly filled. And uh, here you have the orbital picture, which you may get from a ligand field calculation or molecular orbital calculation. Here you have the um, a type of, of uh, orbital, and here you have the irreducible representations according to which these orbitals transform. It's a point group D4H. And uh, the ground state of the molecule has just one hole in the B, you know, B1G orbital, so it's a doublet B1G state. So on this side you have orbitals, and on this side you have states, the doublet B1G state. The uh, lowest energy excited state, uh, state uh, gets one electron from the B2G orbital, it's a doublet B2G state. And then you have a doublet EG state, and uh, just putting one electron from the z squared A1g orbital to this x minus y squared orbital gives you the highest excited state, which is double A1g state. And the excited states are in the order of 10,000 wave numbers above the double B1g ground state. So with UV this absorption spectroscopy, they are principally detectable. However, the D transitions in central symmetry, symmetrical complexes are forbidden, so the electric dipole matrix element is zero, and the most simple explanation of that is that the ground state is gerade with respect to inversion, the excited state is gerade um, with respect to inversion, and the electric dipole operator is ungerade with respect to inversion, so we have, we have a situation G times U times G, which gives U, so the matrix element is zero. You integrate an ungrade fun function from minus infinity to plus infinity, and you get two contributions which exactly cancel. And the way of expressing this, one, one says these transitions are parity forbidden or are called forbidden. So why are they still observed? There are two possibilities. The first for a central symmetrical complex exists a number of ungrade normal moments which eliminate the center of inversion during the vibration. And Frank will talk about normal coordinates tomorrow. And uh, so 
one of the normal coordinates of this tetrachlorocuprate is a B to U vibration. So you put two ligands down and two ligands up. And uh, you have a dynamic change of geometry towards a D to D distorted tetrahedron. And this gives you a transient elimination of the center of inversion. And so you get a little bit of allowedness into your optical transitions. And the physical basis of this is the Fricondon principle. Electronic transitions are fast with respect to nuclear motions, um, which occur during the vibration. Therefore, they do not experience the presence of a center of inversion. Um, a quantitative way of expressing this or formulating this is Herzberg Teller coupling. Um, I come to this later. And um, for D2H, that are global cuprate. All three ligand field transitions are electric dipole allowed by coupling with the unitary mode. So for every transition, which is in principle forbidden, in the true symmetry of the complex, you can find an unitary mode, an odd symmetry mode, which makes that transition allowed. So in solution, if you make that complex and take the spectrum of it, you will see all transitions. Although they are our principle. Forbidden. Second possibility is a static distortion of the ligand field. Um, and this eliminates the center of inversion, of course, as well. And for certain counter ions, the tetrachlorocuprate crystallizes in a non central symmetrical D to D distorted tetrahedral geometry. So you do exactly a distortion along that coordinate, but not in a dynamic way, but in a static way, you freeze the molecule in the distorted geometry. And you get the D2D tetrachloroprate. And then you do the same as in the D4H tetrachloroprate. But um, the Again, the x squared minus y squared is, of course, the highest energy orbital. Single occupied. You have all other orbitals at lower energy. And here you see the irreducible representations according to which these orbitals transform. And you see they don't have a, a g anymore because d to d has no center of inversion as a symmetry. Um, Okay, you have a, now you have a doublet B2 ground state and a doublet E excited state and a doublet B1 excited state and of course a doublet A1 excited state. And this gives you a much more effective elimination of the center of inversion than by just unguard vibration so the DD transitions get more intense. And now I have also written here the polarizations of this transition. So it turns out that the doublet B2 to doublet B transition is XY polarized, and the doublet B2 to doublet A1 transition is Z polarized, and the doublet B2 to doublet B1 transition is forbidden. And the way to see to see that is group theory. So as Serena would put it, you go to your ground first semester group theory course, which does not exist in Germany. And um, the, the point is you have to evaluate this uh, electron rules in the point group of the distorted symmetry. So doublet, doublet E2 to doublet A1, for example, is Z polarized as a UZ operator. So the electric dipole moment around Z transforms as Z transforms as B2. You see that uh, from the character table. So Z transforms as B2. So you have uh, B2, time, B, B2 times B2 is equal A1 times A1. You have A1, A1 times A1. This is A1. Everything is fine. If the triple product um, transforms according to A1 or contains A1, then the matrix element is in principle allowed. The transition is allowed. 
And the other one is um, xy polarized as mu xy transforms as xy transforms as e. So you have this matrix element, you have to take doublet uh, b2 times e gives you e, b times e contains a1, so it's also fine. And doublet b2 times doublet b1 is electric dipole for bin, since b2 times b2 equals a2, but no component of the electric dipole operator transforms as a2, which would be required to make the triple product transform according to a1. Okay, this is a uh, character table. I've also put for you the, the symmetry elements here, so you can let me do that. Three remarks. For an electric dipole matrix element not to vanish the triple product of irreducible representations of the ground state, operated the excited state has to contain symmetric, total symmetric representation, A1, and, and, and in the presence of a center of inversion, this has to be A1G, so more specific, which is not possible for pure DD transitions, only for SP or DP or whatever. Um, and this is a more specific requirement than just the parity selection rule, uh, which uh, corresponds to the, to the import uh, selection rule. And the third point is the underlying source of intensity for VD transitions is a dynamic or static distortion induced mixture of, for example, CT states with ungrade or odd parity to which the optical transitions are allowed. And the way to see this is to do first order perturbation theory, for example, for the static distortion. We have a perturbation theory, we have a perturbation operator, which is just an odd symmetry, ligand field contribution, and we have a perturbed wave function in the excited state, CM prime, this uh, equals the original wave function plus this. Uh, coupling matrix element over the energy denominator times an ungrad function. And now, if you take the matrix element between the ground state function and this and mixed excited state function, you get your original matrix element, which is forbidden. And you get another matrix element from the ground state to an ungrad, odd symmetry excited state, which is allowed times uh, this coupling matrix element of the energy denominator. So with some coefficient, you get a large character in your forbidden transition, and in that case, one says the weak, forbid, weak or forbidden transition borrows or less friendly steals intensity from the strong allowed coefficient. Okay, um, let me go back to the experiments. Uh, the most usual way of doing these measurements is measurements in solution. There you average over all possible directions of the electric field with respect to the molecular axis. So you get no polarized information. Alternatively, you can do you can go to linear polarized light plus, plus single crystals, and you can directly determine the polarization of your optical transitions. However, you have to be careful because you can only align the electric field vector of your electric field, uh, of your incoming radiation, along certain crystal axes. And these crystal axes define the so-called indicatrix of your crystal. If, if you are not Following this rule, you get a rotation of your E vector within the crystal, and you lose your directional information. And um, it's, it, this indicatrix, or these allowed directions, depend upon the crystal symmetry. For an isotropic crystal with cubic symmetry, you can go in any direction you want. For a uniaxial crystal, which is trigonal, tetragonal, or hexagonal, you can direct your E vector either along the C axis or perpendicular to it. You have two possibilities to do these measurements. For biaxial crystals, or for orthorhombic, monoclinic, triclinic, tri 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 uh, the rules are more complicated. For orthorhombic, for example, you have possibility to write direct E along A, B, or C. For monoclinic, E 
parallel and perpendicular to B. And for triclinic uh, crystals, you have to know symmetry defined orientation. So, in principle, in the strict sense, you cannot do polarized single crystal, polarized absorption spectroscopy with triclinic crystals. Um, okay, this is a, an example of a, of a crystal with tetragonal, tetragonal symmetry, so you can either direct your V vector parallel to the C axis of the crystal, this gives you the so called pi spectrum, or you can direct it perpendicular to the C axis, which gives you the sigma spectrum. The third way of doing spectroscopy with such a tetragonal uh, system is to put to align your k vector along the c axis and apply no polarization with your incoming radiation, which gives you the alpha spectrum. And for electric dipole transitions, the alpha spectrum corresponds to the sigma spectrum. Um, and it's even more, more complicated than that because if you want to extract molecular polarizations, you just you have to transform, transform your spectral information um, to the molecules in your unit cell. And you have to know how your molecules are oriented in the unit cell. And of course, it's advantageous if, if your molecular axis coincides with the crystal axis, then you get molecular polarization. But this is rarely the case, unfortunately. So back to tetrachloroprate, the polarized crystal, single crystal spectra gives you the following information. The Z-polarized transition is here at about 9,000 wave number, which is the WB2 to WA1 transition. And the XY-polarized transition is uh, at lower energy. It's a transition to the, to the E state. So by two different experiments, you get two different bands, and you can extract your molecular polarization from these experiments. Very nice experiments, but not many people are doing this in the world, I have to say, unfortunately. The solution spectrum looks like this. This is a, we are still in the, in the, in the D2D case, and the tetrachloroprate um, the D4H, D4H, so the um, symmetric, um, gives, uh, gives you the following spectrum. It's at higher energy. The bands are at higher energy um, and uh, they are much less intense than in the, in the D2D case. And this is, of course, due to the fact that the static distortion gives you more. Um, um, effective elimination of the center of the immersion than just the vibration. Okay, the transitions in D4H are almost one order of magnitude less intense than in the D2D case, and uh, the transitions in D4H are at higher energy uh, than in the D2D case because the D2D distortion lowers the energy of the excited states. Since x square minus y square orbital is lowered by less strong end bond interaction. Okay, now let's go to higher energies. And uh, if we extend our optical absorption spectrum to higher energies, uh, we encounter new and intense absorption bands. And these are the part allowed charge transfer transitions through excitation of an electron from the 3D orbitals <coughs> of the chloride ligands to the half-occupied dx square minus y square orbital of copper. We also call these ligand to metal charge transfer or LCT transitions. We again go to the D4H, tetrachloroprate. Um, each chloride ligand has three. Three p orbitals, one sigma orbital parallel to the copper chloride bond, and two pi orbitals perpendicular to the copper chloride bond. You see these orbitals here. So we have four orbitals, which are sigma orbitals, and uh, eight orbitals, which are pi orbitals. And these can be separated in uh, pi v orbitals, which are vertical to the molecular plane, 
high horizontal orbitals, which are within the monitor. And uh, we are doing now symmetry adapted linear combinations of these atomic orbitals. Um, so the pi sigma orbitals can be linearly combined to four symmetry adapted orbitals, which transform to A1g, E1g, E nu. We can do the same with the uh, pi. Uh, P pi V and the, with the P pi H orbitals. So we made symmetry, symmetry adapted linear combinations. And the power of this is that one ligand orbital of a particular symmetry exclusively combines with a metal orbital of the same symmetry. So this is the power of group theory. So we have to define how our Copper orbitals transform, the S transforms to A1G, the P transforms to EU and A2U, and the D orbitals transform to B1G, B2G, EG, and A1G. And if you do a MO calculation, we arrive at this energy level scheme here. Here we have our copper D orbitals, and here we have all copper. Uh, all chloride orbitals, which are the basically the bonding combinations of the ligand orbitals with the copper D orbitals, and these are the anti bonding combinations of the copper D orbitals with the ligand orbitals. And just as we did with the ligand field transitions, we are now filling the hole in the 3D shell, but not from a lower lying ligand. Of, uh, not from a lower line metal orbital, but from a ligand orbital. So we are making transitions from here to here, from here to here, and so on. And um, these orbitals now, you can see that they have uh, labels G and U. So we have gerade combinations and ungerade, or gerade and post and ungerade and post. These are all gerade, so these transitions are all forbidden, but now in the ligand range here we have new orbitals. So you get transitions from new orbitals to gerade orbitals, and these transitions are allowed. Um, so as for the LF transitions, the, copper, the chloride to, to copper LFCT transitions fill the hole in the copper to copper to 3D shell. So here we have our ligand field states, and here we have our charge transfer states. And uh, you see it starts with a G state, so it's still gerade, gerade, still forbidden. But then it comes EU, so this, is, this should be allowed. E to U, this should be allowed. It should be some more allowed. And here we have an allowed one. <coughs> On, and the intensities of these charge transfer transitions again depend upon the transition date type for matrix elements and for D4H tetrachloroprite, some of these charge transfer transitions are indeed electric dipole allowed. And the way we are checking this is just as we did with the PD transitions in the D2D tetrachloroprite, it takes this triple product. For example, B1G to EU is allowed by EU, since B1G times EU, B1G times EU gives EU, and EU times EU contains A1G. Or B1G to B2U is that polarized, because this matrix element here, if you consider that, that matrix element, and this is uh, B1G times A to U, so the ground state times operator transforms this according to B to U, and B to U times B to U is A1G. So everything is fine, and this transition is the dipole forbidden because it requires a component of the dipole operator which transforms as B to U, and this doesn't exist. So here I've put your character table for B to H, and you'll see components of the transition dipole moment transform as A to U and E U. And there is no component which transforms as B to U. 
Um, of course, one would also like to experimentally determine the polarizations of these charge transfer transitions. In doing this, so the same way as with the ligand transition, ligand field transitions is difficult because you have to make your crystal so thin that it becomes uh, unstable. Uh, another possibility is to do, dilute your complex in a trans transparent matrix that has the same structure as the parent compound and a popular approach is just taking the zinc compound and it also has the same structure as a copper compound for example or you uh, measure uh, your charge transfer spectrum in reflectance and a way to do this is specular reflection you, know, you use your crystal faces like a mirror and you also get some spectroscopic information a reflection spectrum which however you have to transform and the way of doing this is Kahn's chronic transformation and uh, also in that case you can generate an absorption spectrum and this has been done again by, by the Thormon and um, uh, this is, is, is given here um, so this is a spectrum par parallel to x this is a spectrum <coughs> parallel to y and this is a spectrum parallel to, to z and you can assign your, your bands Okay, um, so this is basically what I've told you up to this point is basically some information about the ligand field and the charge transfer, span, trans charge transfer bands which you can gain from optical absorption spectroscopy. I have not said anything about the band width and the bandwidth is also an important part of, of the spectroscopic methods and the problem or the difficulty with optical absorption spectroscopy is that the bands are broad so ideally every spectroscopy would be like NMR nice sharp lines and evaluate everything very easily but in, in uh, optical spectroscopy the bands are normally broad I said about 3000 wave numbers and um, a way of treating this or, or seeing this is uh, to deal a little bit with band shape analysis and I will go briefly to, uh, through that um, how much? Um, so, uh, up to this point, we have not included yet the nuclear coordinates. I've only talked about electrons. And um, the way one can include nuclear coordinates is in terms of normal coordinates. And Frank will tell you something about normal coordinates tomorrow. And so, every molecule has a set of normal coordinates. Um, and uh, these are normally called QK. And uh, for, for simplicity, we, we only consider one Q here. And uh, for one vibration, one active vibration. And uh, so the molecule can be treated as a harmonic oscillator. And this vibration level is I. And I goes from zero to whatever number. And um, in order to take account uh, of these normal coordinates, to replace your electronic wave function by um, a total wave function, so CL, it goes to CLI, which depends upon electronic coordinates and nuclear coordinates, which you write as a product of the electronic wave function times a vibrational wave function. And you do the same for the excited state. So the excited state is a psi mj. Uh, times the vibrational um, function which is in another vibrational state J and uh, your electric dipole moment um, contains now when you do that uh, electronic coordinates and nuclear coordinates 
And you can, if you want, divide that into an electronic part and a nuclear part. And if you evaluate the transition dipole matrix element between those total functions, those product functions, you can write this as an electronic matrix element times an overlap integral over um, two um, wave functions plus um, a delta Lm, so on overlap integral over two electronic wave functions, which is delta Lm, a chronica delta times a matrix element of a nuclear part of the, this uh, dipole, electric dipole matrix element. And uh, as delta Lm equals 1 for L equal M and 0 for L unequal M, this is, a this is just a vibrational transition with a new brown state. So the second term refers to electric dipole transitions versus the brown state, which is a matter of vibrational spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy. And the first term is a transition from a vibrational level I in the ground state to a vibrational level J of the excited state, and this is a so-called vibronic transition. So you both change the electronic state and your vibrational state. And the intensity now is the square of the electric dipole matrix element is the electric dipole matrix element times this overlap integral square. Um, and this uh, has a name, this is a Frank Compton factor. <coughs> and you have a, an analytical evaluation is possible for harmonic potentials in L and M and if the force constants of the two states <coughs> are equal. And uh, the most important vibrations in transition metal chemistry of, are of course metal leaking vibrations. These are vibrations we are most interested in. And now we have two cases. First case is that both states L and M have the same metal ligand distance. So the metal ligand distance does not change if you go from the ground state to the excited state. And then <coughs> the Frank uh, you can replace the Frank Compton factor by delta ij. So the vibrational state cannot change, and you have transitions from 0 to 0, from 1 to 1, from 2 to 2, and so on. And um, <coughs> the intensity of the vibronic transitions is just the electric dipole matrix elements times delta ij. So all electric dipole intensity is contained in one individual ii transition, for example, 0, 0 if you go to higher temperatures, 1, 1, 2, 2, and so on. But they are all at the same position. And this you call the zero phonon transition, or zero phonon lines. So you get one sharp line, and there are examples for this. For example, the quartet A to G to doublet EG transition in chromium 3. So uh, why is this a zero phonon transition? So why does, in this transition of chromium-3, the metal ligand distance does not change? It's a split field transition. It's a split field transition. So normally you learn all ligand field transitions are T to G to E G. Yeah? And these transitions exactly make a delta Q. But this is a transition just within the T to G configuration. So an intra-configurational transition. Uh, you just couple the spins a little bit different, but you stay within the T to G three configuration, so you don't change your point. Uh, second case is you encounter in 99% of all spectra which you take, the L and M do not have the same metal ligand distance, so the excited state is displaced along the coordinate, and in most cases, and in general, this is a totally symmetric coordinate. 
And then the rule chi i equal chi i is not obeyed anymore, which means you can have all transitions. From 0 to 0, from 0 to 1, from 0 to 2, and so on, from 1 to 0, 1 to 1, and so on, from 2 to 0, etc. Of course, the intensity of the vertical transition, so it's displaced, the excited state is displayed in, in this coordinate, for example, a totally symmetric coordinate. Uh, and the, the most intense transition is the transition which goes from, from uh, the ground state here to, to the, the vertical transition, which just goes from the center of the ground state to this excited state. The intensity of the vertical transition will be strongest, but all others have intensity. So uh, your electric dipole matrix element squares is the electric dipole matrix element times the Fraconten factor. And the Fraconten factor, in that case, in, in, in the case you have equal force constants, harmonic potentials, you have these analytical expressions for the Fraconten factor, so this is the Poisson distribution. And uh, you get a, a progression in the coordinate Q, Q, so it's 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, and so on. You have a progression in the coordinate, and from that progression, you can calculate, or if you fit that progression, you can calculate your excited state distortion, your delta Q. You can determine how much, uh, how large uh, the metal liquid bond in the excited state is elongated. You can, from from fitting this intensity distribution, you can determine your excited state distortion. And we have done that for a nitrido complex. We have to come to an end in order to have a couple of minutes for the MCD. We have done this for this nitri nice nitrido complex here, which we deal, dealt with in, in, in terms of our research uh, in, in nitrogen fixation. And it's a molybdenum 4 complex. Molybdenum 4 has two D electrons, which are in a non bonding orbital here in the DXY. And, um, you can make transition from the dxy to the dxc and to the dyz. So you have transitions with within the split T to G manifold. So these are ligand field transitions. And we measured this absorption spectrum here. And we, you see we, we got this nice progression in the molybdenum N stretchy coordinate. And uh, from that progression, we could determine that the molybdenum N frequency in the excited state is 810 wave numbers. And from fitting the intensity <coughs> distribution to this expression, we got the one uh, with factor S, which was 2, about 2. And if uh, we know the um, force constant, which we know from the frequency and the S, we can calculate the delta Q, and it gives us a delta Q of 0 0.12 angstroms. And fortunately, we also got the luminescence spectrum of that complex, and it gives us the same transition, but as a transition from the excited state to the ground state, and you also see a progression, but in that case, you see the spacing between the individual diachronic uh, <coughs> transitions corresponds to the molybdenum N stretching frequency in the ground state, which is 980 wave numbers. And from that, you get a force constant of 7. And this is the one with factor, which is the same from as absorption. And the delta Q is again 0.11 angstroms. So this is here absorption and emission. And normally, you see 
that in absorption and emission, the zero zero transition overlap. It's a normal case. If you take an organic molecule and take an absorption spectrum and an emission spectrum, the absorption and the emission overlap in the zero zero transition. But that was not the case in our example, but there was a was a gap between the zero zero transition which you got in absorption and in emission. And the reason for that is that the excited state has a signal triplet splitting. And we do, if we do the absorption experiment, we go to the excited state singlet. And we do, if we do an emission experiment, we start from the excited state triplet. So and, 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 and this is the piece of information we got from that. So from the intensity distribution, we determine some of these factors. We determine the stretch and frequency this is the ground state and the excited states. We could determine the force constant in the ground state and the excited state. And from both experiments, we got the excited state displacement, 0.11 angstrom, which was the same. And we got the singular triplet splitting in the excited state, which was 3,030 wave numbers. So if you evaluate your optical absorption factor carefully, you can derive a lot of information about your molecule, not only in the ground state, but also in the excited state. And this is the uh, use of optical absorption spectroscopy. And, uh, okay. <coughs> The ground state information, 980 wave numbers, you get, of course, as well from resonance Raman. So from optical spectroscopy, we got 980. From Raman, we get 981. The molecular end stretching frequency, so this is the frequency in the ground state. And you can also do this by RR, IR spectroscopy. For some reason, we did this on tungsten nitride complexes, but you also get 980 wave numbers for the metal and stretching frequency. <clears throat> but besides that, of course, by optical spectroscopy, you get also the vibration, vibration in the excited state. Okay, let me take the um, just one remark. What I have, what I'm leaving out now, is uh, the Hertzberg teller coupling. So I told you that. Uh, one can also make ligand field transitions allowed by coupling to ungerade vibrations. I have put this in a revised version of my talk, so I will download this, and if you are interested, you can download to the revised version, and then you also have the Herzberg Teller coupling in it. Uh, it's a bit more complicated, but I need it out now. Yeah, so this was about what I wanted to tell you about optical absorption spectroscopy. I have a couple of minutes left for MCD, and I may be able to give you some of the flavor of MCD in these minutes. Um, it's, it's, you can consider MCD as a more involved very variant of electronic absorption spectroscopy, but there's more, more interesting parts on it. So it's also, it also serves to characterize the electronic structure of transition metal complexes. During this absorption spectroscopy, it deals with electric dipole transitions between electronic states. EPR, you have heard of EPR, deals with magnetic dipole transitions between magnetically split states. And magnetic circular dichroism measures electric dipole transitions between magnetically split electronic states. So you have a magnetic field which splits your ground state and also the excited state. And if you carefully evaluate your MCD data, you get excited state information as well as ground state information. And the power of MCD is. Um, impressively documented in, in this 
this picture. Uh, this is what, how we started a mixed valent manganese 3, manganese 4 complex, which gives a very dull optical absorption spectrum, but a highly resolved MCD spectrum. So we were quite excited when we got that. This is how we started MCD spectroscopy. But uh, up to the present day, we have not understood it. So the message is MCD gives you a lot of information, but you have to be able to extract that information. Um, the MCD spectroscopy does not give you an epsilon, but a delta epsilon. This is a difference of the epsilon between the left polarized and the right polarized light. And uh, it has three contributions, an A term, a B term, and a C term. And an A term derives from a magnetically split excited state. And um, as the splitting is normally not very large, you have a magnetic field, and as your bands are fairly broad, I've spoken about bandwidth, you get a superposition of two bands of opposite sign, which are slightly shifted with respect to each other. And this is um, <coughs> so-called A term. So the A term has a derivative shape of so Your one uh, transition is right circular polarized, the other is left circular polarized, so they have different signs. The superposition of these two transitions gives you a derivative shape. The second term is a B term, which derives from some field-induced mixing also between excited states. And uh, the A term and the B term derive from magnetically split excited state of the action of the magnetic field, uh, the, the manifold of the excited state. And the third term, the C term, derives from the magnetically split ground state. And this is the term which is strongest at low, lowest temperature. Because uh, if you go to very low temperature or low temperature, you have a population difference between your ground state Zeeman levels. So <clears throat> uh, your um, MCD intensity depends upon temperature and depends upon field. And this you can use to extract electronic structure information uh, also from the ground state. So the most, and you have paramagnetic compounds, the most interesting terms are the C terms. And I will also focus focus on, on, on these C terms in, in one form. Yeah, as I said, if you have low temperature paramagnetic species, then your MCD, C, uh, uh, ter MCD intensity is dominated by the C term intensity. And the C term is the sum over effective transition dipole moments times the GX, GY, GZ values of your ground state G tensor. So this is just for an isolated karma standard, like for S equal one half state. So this is a simple case which you, which you can consider. So in your C term intensity, you have uh, products of uh, effective transition dipole moments and values of your G tensors. And you can use MCD to determine if you know these transition dipole moments, you can determine your G tensor. And if you know your G tensor, you can determine your effective transition dipole moments. So there's a correlation between EPR and MCD. And uh, the transition dipole moments, um, the effective transition dipole moments contain products of uh, transition dipole matrix elements in orthogonal directions. So V and W are, for example, Y and Z, and the excited states have to be coupled by spin orbit coupling along the third axis. It's quite complicated. And uh, we have studied a very simple case in which we only had an XY polarized transition and a coupling uh, along, along the Z direction 
but I will come to this uh, in a second. So, um, and this uh, coupling between the excited states or the coupling which you need for MCD intensity, the spin orbit coupling, can either be between two excited states, J and K, so you can make two transitions to a state J and a state K, which are coupled by spin orbit coupling, or your uh, intermediate state K is coupled by the spin orbit coupling to the ground state. And one refers to this as a JK coupling and to this as a K coupling. So what you have to have is two transitions along two orthogonal directions, U and V, and a spin orbit coupling along a third direction. And if this is fulfilled, you have C term intensity. Two mutually orthogonal transitions and spin orbit coupling along the third direction. Um, okay, this is an experimental setup for MCD. So you have a CD spectrometer and a magnetic field. Uh, we have here a YASCO CD uh, spectrometer. It makes left and right circular polarized light. You have the cryostat, you have a magnetic field. The so magnetic field is along the direction of, of the light. And here you have a photomultiplier to, to detect your, your signals. Typically, a uh, magnetic cryostat goes to a couple of Tesla. We have seven Tesla in Mülheim. They have 10 Tesla magnet. And you need low temperatures to do MCD spectroscopy. So if you go pumped helium, you can go down to 2K. To uh, this is an experimental setup. I uh, will not go into detail. And this is the first example which we, which we studied. It was um, a again, a molybdenum complex, but not a nitrido. It was an oxide, a molybdenum oxo complex with three chloride ligand, ligands. So a molybdenum 5 system, just with one electron. It had, it had this MCD spectrum here. And if you go from plus 3 Tesla to minus 3 Tesla, it will change its sign. And OK, we learned MCD spectroscopy based on, on, on this complex. So the, the agenda was just to compare this to the UV, this spectrum takes resonance drama, takes the FDIR, you need these techniques to assign your bands. And uh, another way would, of course, to directly calculate the MCD spectrum from theory, which is difficult, but as Frank tells me, we are approaching this. And um, what we did is we tried to interpret this spectrum based on, on the calculated molecular orbitals. And the, the question was, is that possible? And uh, again, here you see the optical absorption spectrum. Here you see the MCD spectrum. You have a couple of bands. And it turns out that this, this first band, this is a, a intense band, is a charge transfer transition, a sigma to molybdenum charge transfer transition. And interestingly, there are the following bands. And the three, four, five, six, and this is the so-called uh, pseudo A term. So it looks like an A term, but it is a C term. It derives from two excited states, which are coupled by spin orbit coupling. And in our case, this A term was doubled because we had two starting orbitals of opposing symmetry going to these excited states. So we did not only have one A term, but we have two A terms, pseudo A terms, so a double pseudo A term. And uh, so the first plus minus sign is here a transition from the ground state to a state J and the coupled state K plus minus. And in turn we have a second excited state, which also makes a pseudo A term, but with opposing signs. And we did an MO calculation, and the challenge is to within the same orbit scheme to identify the um, starting orbitals and the accepting orbitals. 
and the donor orbitals were um, pi orbitals from the chloride ligands and the acceptor orbitals were dxc and dyz at some leptonum center uh, which are unoccupied but coupled by spin orbit coupling. And uh, we also wanted to determine the signs of this transition, so you have to try determine your, the direction of your transition dipole moments, which we did based on our um, uh, molecular orbitals. And uh, so we, we arrived with a picture that we had a, a symmetric and an anti-symmetric combination of out-of-plane high donor orbitals on the two of the, the chloride ligands, which make transitions in the DXC and DYZ orbital. And these transitions are XY polarized, XY polarized along the molecular axis, and the final states are coupled via the spin orbit coupling along the set. So we had exactly these conditions fulfilled. A very, very uh, simple case. And um, the, the direction we want to go now is to also do these experiments at variable temperature and uh, variable speed. So we explicitly include the explicitly also include the um, temperature and, and field dependence of these uh, transitions. And uh, one example where this has been done. And I again took this from the literature from the, from the group of uh, Solomon, was a, a copper superoxo complex. So you have a copper 2 and a superoxo ligand with a TMG3 tran ligand. And uh, this is the ground state level scheme of that complex. And what does that tell you with respect to the coupling between the copper and the superoxolate? It's ferromagnetic. So you have a ferromagnetic coupling between the copper and the superoxolate. You have an S equal 1 ground state, S equal 0 excited state, and this S equal, S equal 1 ground state splits by zero field splitting, by axial splitting, plus rhombic splitting. And you can take MCD to determine these spin hematomic parameters. And this has been done for, for, for this case. And what you have to do is to take those isotherms, the MCD intensity as a function of beta H over 2 kT. So you, you go at a, at, a, at a fixed temperature and vary your magnetic field and take the MCD intensity as a function of the field and plot that in this way and you are fitting these curves to this expression and this is now much more complicated than the expression which I showed you it contains expectation value of the the spin operators in, the, in these various levels, which arise from the action of the spin Hamiltonian parameter, times the effective transition matrix elements, which are products of electric dipole <coughs> matrix elements. And um, as I said, either you have to know your polarizations and you can, you can determine the spin Hamiltonian parameters or you can determine the spin Hamiltonian parameters uh, knowing your um, polarizations. These people did all at one, at, at once, which I consider difficult, but this is, these are the parameters which they got. So they got a, an axial splitting of 1.2 wave numbers and an E over E of 1.2 from fitting this curves to, to this expression. Um, okay, so with these remarks, I wanted to, to, to finish my talk. I hope I was able to show you um, that one can 
gain a lot of information about the electronic ground state and the elect uh, electronic excited states by optical absorption spectroscopy. You have to know what is behind these parameters, intensity, position, band shape, you have to know, recognize the progression, you have to know how to evaluate that progression. Uh, so, there's a lot of information behind the seemingly simple technique. And uh, I, I was able to show this to you. MCD is intrinsically a much more complicated experiment and requires a lot more of uh, elaborated theory, I would put it. But, on the other hand, MCD gives you a wealth of information. I've shown you this. Uh, to uh, spectra, the MCD spectrum and the optical absorption spectrum. Um, MCD is for me the technique which in principle gives you maximum information about excited electronic states, but it gives you so much information that you must be able to, to uh, uh, also interpret it. On the other hand, you can do MCD spectroscopy on a phenomenological level and just fitting this variable temperature, variable field um, curves, use MCD to determine spin hammer And in that respect, MCD is complementary to EPR. So MCD is also a ground state method. And uh, okay, that was what I wanted to tell you and I hope I have not been told too long and has not been too heavy, but uh, again, thanks for the